thank you very, very much. It's just such a wonderful day. It's such a pleasure to be here and have the chance to share this amazing experience with, with all of you and to revisit the many um, uh, wonderful accomplishments that uh, Paul has, uh, has given to the world and to, and to all of us. So what I'm going to try to do in a very short time is to touch on two interesting issues. Um, one is some, some recent work that I'm fascinated by that really, I think, illuminates some of the key questions that are still there. And that's why I called this talk an enduring challenge. I think there are still some really interesting and important questions to be done for all of you young students in, in polar ozone, especially Arctic ozone. And then I'm also going to, in that, as well as some of the other things I'll talk about, I'll deal with some key historical contributions to understanding ozone, some of which have been touched on already, but I'll go into a little bit more detail. Well, the ozone hole was, if you will, a focusing event for the world on this very important policy-relevant question when the British Antarctic Survey announced their remarkable drop in ozone that they had observed by 1984. The October monthly mean values were uh, quite, quite clear that uh, ozone had changed in a way that had not been seen before since the measurements began in the 1950s. Uh, I update this slide periodically and I'll need to do that soon uh, again, but as you can see, uh, the, the levels of ozone dropped uh, remarkably in the, in the 1990s and 2000s. Now we see years when the ozone hole is deeper or shallower that uh, largely are driven by differences in dynamics, cold years or warm years, uh, but, but we still uh, continue to have dramatic Antarctic ozone holes. And of course, the Japanese and American stations were able to confirm the British measurements, which was really, really quite a, a rapid and remarkable series of years when those of us who were lucky enough to be involved in that research were, were experiencing the kind of thing that you, that you really only dream of, that someday you might find yourself in the midst of that kind of a scientific advance. Um, in 1986, my colleagues and I published a paper in Nature where we talked about the importance of cold Antarctic stratospheric surfaces that uh, are really the, the, the key process involved in making this happen. And what they do is to enhance the amount of chlorine that can be activated for ozone loss through, through, through this reaction, HCl reacting with chlorine nitrate on a, on a cloud surface. Um, but there's still some very interesting questions around. What, what about uh, the Arctic? Do we have the same kind of chemistry operating there where temperatures are warmer? By definition, Antarctica is the coldest place on Earth and the Arctic is warmer. And how important is denitrification where the nitric acid actually gets removed through the sedimentation of, of these, these wonderful, beautiful polar stratospheric cloud particles? How important is that process? That, that was really a key contribution by Paul to talk about the role of nitric acid trihydrate clouds and also uh, Brian Toon at, at that time. A really remarkable paper, I think, that uh, Paul and his colleagues uh, followed up on in, in that issue was, was this one with Thomas Peter and, and, and Weibel and many others who are here. Uh, in fact, <laughs> and uh, what they pointed out in this wonderful science paper was that really it, it, you can find uh, reactive nitrogen removal, this process of denitrification quite markedly in altitude, and that actually tells you some things about what kind of particles are at work that you wouldn't, wouldn't find any other way. Uh, they then looked at what the role of, of that denitrification was for ozone loss, and it's really the difference between the dashed and, and, and solid blue lines where you see that without denitrification, you would expect to see much less ozone loss by the end of March than what you get with denitrification, which really shows how important the deactivation of that activated chlorine is. That's really where that, that comes in. Well, has there been an Arctic ozone hole is the issue that's attracted a lot of attention in the last few years, particularly because in 2011, we, we had a, a, an unusual year Here's an Antarctic ozone hole, and here's something that's starting to look a bit like an Arctic ozone hole. It was an unusually cold spring, and the ozone losses were impressive. It wasn't as extensive in, uh, in, in, in its dimensions. It was smaller, and it wasn't quite as deep, 
But I think there's some really interesting new insights into chemistry and denitrification that are to be had by comparing the two. And we've been pursuing that with my, in, in my group at MIT, looking at things like this, where this is from uh, satellite data at 20 kilometers. This is the ozone in the Antarctic. It's now on a log scale as a function of day of year. This is the Arctic. So indeed, 2011, you, you began to see something that started to look a bit like an Antarctic ozone hole, much more so than, say, the Arctic in 2005. But notice on this log scale, you, be, you, you can really now see the, uh, the, the very, very low values. Ozone really, truly is driven to zero in the heart of the Antarctic vortex. Here's the same kind of thing. You can actually go back to the 1960s with, with balloon measurements. You can look at the, uh, the ups and downs in the Arctic, and you can certainly see some evidence for ozone loss in the uh, 1990s and the 2000s, but it's really uh, very, very different from these extreme low values uh, that you see uh, in the Antarctic. And even in the average sense, the Arctic values are just not nearly as depleted as what you see at that altitude uh, in the Antarctic. So here's a, another way to look at it. If you plot ozone as a function of temperature, here's a bunch of different um, Arctic years. And as you can see, you never have ozone at, th this is now at 24 kilometers or 30 millibars. You never see ozone going below about two to three parts per million by volume at that altitude. I'll show you another altitude in just a minute. The color scale here is showing you how much nitric acid is in the particles. And so it's from simultaneous satellite measurements. And the neat thing is that you can look at the same thing in the Antarctic and you see really quite a different world. It's really showing you how important that removal of, of nitric acid, or at least the very cold temperatures that were experienced as the nitric acid was removed, that's causing this kind of behavior. So if you look at ozone versus temperature, what you see is that in the Antarctic, you have a lot of this blue air, which is air that's very, very heavily denitrified. And that's the air that gets the remarkable ozone losses, driving it well below one part per million. At 24 kilometers, you just don't see that at all uh, in, in the Arctic, even in 2011. So minus 85 at this altitude is cold enough. Minus 82 is clearly not cold enough. That's the, the, the big difference. It's really just a few degrees causes all that difference. Um, this air up here that's warmer will have been colder earlier or it wouldn't be denitrified. So it's either had a, a past history that was colder earlier or it's actually mixed with air that has been uh, heavily denitrified. So it doesn't tell you that it's actually the act of denitrification itself that's causing the ozone loss to be so much more intense. It, it, but it's telling you that air that has been that cold has experienced substantially more ozone loss it could just be a different chemical process. You want to be careful not taking the correlation too far. If you look at 20 kilometers, now you can see what was really different about 2011. It had a significant amount of denitrification, not nearly as much as Antarctica, but a significant amount. So really, it's those very cold temperatures below minus 82 that are key in driving the ozone below, say, two parts per million. You just don't get there without seeing extremely cold temperatures. And that should, uh, oh, I'm sorry, this got cut off a little bit. Um, the, the, this is a, a, was, when it was properly shown, was the, the, the title page of the Crutzen and Arnold uh, paper, which really showed this to the world for the first time. So I think it's, it's a wonderful example of how Paul's insight about nitric acid trihydrate particles and about that sort of chemistry was really key to understanding the Antarctic, but there's still significant questions at work about exactly how the solid PSCs and exactly the role of denitrification between the two hemispheres leads to such a, a remarkably different uh, uh, atmosphere in the Arctic compared to the Antarctic. I think I stole this slide from, from Guy Brasseur, actually, because now I'm going to take you down a short trip down memory lane for a couple of minutes. Uh, I want to hearken back to, to the early days of, of, of Paul's work. This has already been highlighted by others, so I don't have to spend too much time on it. Certainly his 1970 paper identifying this catalytic cycle that is uh, so important in the background stratosphere and important in the perturbation, because of the perturbation to nitrous oxide, N2O, by uh, particularly agricultural activity, uh, that, that really alerted the world to, to a new phenomenon. And later work, especially by Harold Johnston, 
making the connection to the reactive nitrogen produced by supersonic transports, uh, which were proposed to fly in large numbers, what really added to, to the importance of that. But I think the, the main thing I want to emphasize here is this last point, that those studies really paved the way for chemical kinetics to become linked with atmospheric chemistry and for the whole field to assume a far greater societal importance. So fundamentally, this paper, I think, was, was the, the birth of a scientific community, our community. Um, as others have commented on it, it, it wasn't just a theory. Uh, within a few years, Paul and his colleagues actually showed that uh, if you added nitrogen oxides to the stratosphere, you would actually deplete ozone. And I'm very glad that uh, Arlen Kruger was actually here last night. I think he's still here. Um, they made measurements that showed this remarkable drop in ozone at high latitudes in 1972 associated with a solar proton event. And those high energy protons had been of interest to people who study the upper atmosphere for, for many years. Crutzen and his colleagues showed that the observed ozone depletion uh, due to the added NOx matched what they expected very well. So now you, you, you actually didn't have to just talk about a theory, now you had proof and this is from Science News in January of 1976. Uh, what they were reporting was, uh, what was the importance of this. And uh, Crutzen and Sherry Rowland uh, both said, you know, this is now going to satisfy the show me crowd. We can actually show you that added NOx does deplete ozone. Well, I became a graduate student in 1977. I had the good fortune to come to NCAR and work with Paul Crutzen and Jack Fishman, among others. Uh, also with Harold Johnston, my advisor at, at Berkeley. And uh, Paul said, you know, we ought to revisit those solar proton events and really look carefully at that chemistry. And so we did that and published a couple of different papers in planetary and space science looking at the production of reactive nitrogen and reactive hydrogen. And I just want to say that Paul still looks the same, but I don't know about me. Um, and uh, the other person there is a wonderful gentleman named George Reed, who many of you know. Um, you can uh, look at the ion chemistry that makes reactive nitrogen and reactive hydrogen in a proton event and come up with a, a, a table like this one that really begins to impress on you how the, the flow of, of charged uh, particles is, is so complicated. The, the exchange between different ions and neutrals in the mesosphere is really quite amazing. And so I think it was really the training that I got from Paul that allowed me to come up with this little diagram showing you exactly where all that charge goes. And I'm pretty sure it was Paul who said, you know, this reminds me of like a mouse. You know, it's like a mouse running around the way that the, the, the charge goes from O4 plus to taking up a water and making O2 plus plus water. Uh, and then if that encounters an electron, uh, then that hydrogen won't be produced. But the water might go on to add another water, make this guy, uh, and, and eventually be able to make OH and, and hydrogen, which is the way that you make uh, reactive hydrogen. So our little mouse has a chance to make the cheese if it can go back to uh, OH and H. I don't remember, Paul, if you remember talking about cheese, but I'm pretty sure that was your idea. Um, or the mouse might end up getting eaten by the cat, in which case you don't get any odd hydrogen. Um, so we, we had a lot of fun with this kind of, uh, of chemistry, and then we were lucky that we actually had a test case that was measured by the Solar Mesosphere Explorer that allowed us to actually see ozone losses at uh, about 76 kilometers. But what was surprising to us was that on the evening side of the, of, the, of the orbit, a different amount of ozone was lost, and on the morning side, which we really hadn't expected, and so we thought about the fact that it, it's, this was a tremendous bonus for this problem as we began to understand it because what was going on was that the production of odd hydrogen from the protons had to compete with the photolysis of water vapor. So in classic Crutzen style, you could write down a little equation that actually described what was going on, described that competition, and uh, it, that sort of a simple formula actually fit the zenith angle dependence or the, the latitudinal dependence of that, of that very well. So, uh, with that, I just want to say what a tremendous privilege it, it has been, what a tremendous mentor uh, I've been lucky enough to have. Uh, I was, uh, uh, I think probably the thing I took away from having been Paul's last American graduate student until all the other Americans came over to Germany, like Mark Lawrence, um, was, was the, the feeling of fun. I mean, if Paul is about anything, he's about the fact that science should always be tremendous fun. And uh, Paul, I thank you for that. It's been amazing. Thank you very much.